Greetings. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum, Music, the Soundtrack of Our Lives, an exploration of memory, meaning, and home. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for U.S. alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the United States. This year's programming is particularly special since it is the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Focused on cross-cultural issues, the Fulbright Forum series features extraordinary presenters from around the world. Our presenter today is concert pianist, Sineway artist, and Fulbright scholar Pamela Howland. Pamela Howland was a 2017 Fulbright Scholar to Poland, a ranger, composer, and educator based in North Carolina. She tours throughout the US and Europe, has recorded 18 CDs, been featured on live NPR programs and American Public Media's performance today, and has over 11 million listens for her version of Chopin's Farewell Waltz on Spotify. The Fulbright Association is pleased that the forum, this forum is sponsored by Take the Lead North Carolina whose mission is to enhance the education, cultural awareness, health and physical fitness, self-esteem, character, confidence, and leadership abilities of children, teens, and special populations. Take the Lead offers programs that use dance, movement, drama, music, visual arts, and filmmaking as vehicles to change the lives of those who participate. For more information and to donate, visit takethelead.nc.org. I will now hand it over to Pamela for today's forum. Thank you so much, Munir, um, and I'd like to thank again my dear friend and colleague Ann Gwill of Take the Lead North Carolina, who's helping to sponsor today's forum, and of course the Fulbright Association with my colleagues there, Munir and Shaz and John Bader, Executive Director. They really help us sort of keep the home fires burning. So thank you all, and thank you all uh, for tuning in, and I hope I'm not echoing. I was hearing or seeing something that we might have some echoes. At any rate, um, I have lots of music to play for you today and a couple of video clips, but first I want to explore this topic a little bit, the idea of the soundtrack, music, the soundtrack of our lives. Um, I love this phrase, it's very near and dear to my heart. I did not coin the phrase, the famous um, American um, entertainer and host of the famous show American Bandstand, Dick Clark, is the one who's associated with that. And this American Bandstand was um, a show of pop music and he hosted from the mid 1950s until 1990. And you can imagine the difference between going from Chuck Berry and Elvis all the way to Prince and Madonna. But the soundtrack concept doesn't just work for pop music. It works for literally every genre. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I also want to make a distinction between a playlist and a soundtrack. Playlists are cool, so many people make them, and it's the idea that you want to get into a certain mood um, and stay there. So you curate a list of pieces to listen to for like working out or sleeping or studying or for romance or partying or whatever, but it keeps you there. But a soundtrack um, conveys a sense of motion and a journey through time. And it's something that accompanies us all the way through our lives, both individually and collectively. So it's not a coincidence that the term soundtrack is a film term. So quite literally what's happening is that this music that you have inside you is the uh, movie score to the movie that is your life, if you will. Um, again, a playlist is situational, it's repetitive, you want to get yourself um, to a certain place and stay there. You choose that, and that's very much in the here and now. But a soundtrack, the odd thing is that it sort of chooses us. And it may be mixed up with just um, all kinds of different genres of music, like some opera and some um, piano music and country or uh, ragtime or whatever, or it may be one genre, but it follows you through your whole life. and. It's formed in early childhood, even though we may not be conscious of that, but it has this great flowering in the teenage years. Um, and everybody, I think, no matter what music they listen to, has had this experience before. 
you're hearing a piece of music or a fragment and bam, you hear that piece of music and it floods your brain with memories. It takes you back to something from a long time ago, whether it's weeks or years or decades and your senses are heightened and you can almost see who you were then, what you wore, who you were with, maybe who you loved, what was going on in your life. And that is the power of music to connect us up with our, sort of encode our memories. And the connection between the memories and the meaning is what we're going to listen to today. And it's what gives us a sense of kind of um, centeredness and belonging or a sense of home. And this is why, for me, this is such a powerful potential empathy building tour because we can understand ourselves better, but more importantly, understand those who maybe we don't think are like us, either individuals or groups, by looking at their music. There's one tiny example of this. It's, we could have a whole seminar on it, but it has to do with um, the research being done on music and memory care. So for people with Alzheimer's disease or um, other um, issues, um, memory issues, there is um, a program, a beautiful documentary film called Alive Inside, but the idea is to reconnect the person who may not be very functional in the here and now with their soundtrack, whatever that is, blues, gospel, Puccini opera, um, Zydeco, whatever it is. And so many instances there are of people just coming alive, either being able to speak, sing lyrics, move. So this is really what we're talking about, and it's a great documentary. All right, so the music for today that I'll play you is from my own personal soundtrack, and um, I hope it'll resonate with you and get you thinking about how this works in your own life. But I have a film clip that I'd like to just set up for you, um, and it's something that's very foundational for me and this journey um, that I've been on. So what, what it is, is 2013 in Warsaw, Poland, and it's World Music Day. And I was there um, playing, and a very activist friend of mine decided that we needed to put a grand piano on a cart. So they got a potato cart, it was pulled through the streets of Warsaw. You're gonna see this with trams and buses going by, it was a little scary. A variety of pianists played, but then we would pull over and um, stop and a crowd would gather. And I was the very fortunate pianist who was playing right outside Chopin's Church of the Holy Cross. And I call it his church because that is indeed where his actual heart resides. His body is in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, but that's another whole topic, very fascinating story. But at any rate, my host started to say in Polish that president, president is maybe coming. I can't see anything, but what happens is in a split second, a motorcade comes up, limo arrives where I am, the window rolls down and Paul McCartney's face shines out, waves, gives me the thumbs up and drives off. And um, so this was pretty amazing. Um, and I was playing the famous Chopin raindrop prelude. Let's go ahead and look at that clip now. <laughs> But at any rate, what it did that was so important, besides the fact that, yes, it was very cool to have one of my idols, musical idols, um, you know, waving and giving me the thumbs up, it gave me a clear and sort of legitimate pathway forward as a classical musician to feel confident in my instinct of trying to combine different genres of music 
um, and different types of music to create richness and diversity for inclusivity. And I began to see how much more music was like than different, no matter what the genres, you know, whether it's Bollywood or old time church music or um, anything, you know, Baroque music, whatever, swing. We have a lot of similarities. And what came to me was an analogy um, that for me was really useful. And that is between the human genome or DNA and the structure of music or musical DNA. And it gives me great comfort to know what the scientists have been telling us for the last 20 some years, which is that we as humans are 99.9% .9 connected. No matter how we look, our skin, hair, eye color, who our people are, where we're from, where our story is, we are built the same way. But it's in that 0.1% um, difference that's so magical. And that's where all the stuff lies that makes us ourselves and individuals. Um, and so the thing is that there's a two-edged sword with this and we can recognize and celebrate um, these differences and find our commonalities or reject that for division and hierarchies, which too often happens so that people are divided into they're good, they're bad, um, they belong, they don't belong, they're like us, they're other. And strangely enough, this whole thing occurs in music as well. So let's just go with the 99.9% of, of DNA of music being alike. So that would be melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, form, all of these things. But the 0.1%, again, of differences between the genres is where the magic is because of this infinite combination of the bones or the DNA, melody, harmony, rhythm, all of that stuff, how it can be combined completely differently to get a completely unique sound, all in the service of the emotion of the music, which is really important. Um, and you know, classical music, my field, I have to say, has been a bad actor historically because they have almost enjoyed, I think, vilifying and categorizing other genres of music as less than, but I'm trying to change that as well as quite a few other people and um, I think it's working. But the funny thing is it may be in human nature because from time immemorial, we've had the older generation saying, the younger generation, their music is terrible. It, I don't understand it. It makes me sick. It's ruining society. But this has happened always, both in the pop fields and in classical. We've had that very, very um, kind of uh, big arguments. So whether it's pop or classical, um, I think that's something to pay attention to. Um, all right, so now let's go ahead and get to some real music. And I'd like to play the ra so-called raindrop prelude for you. That was um, the piece that you might have heard that I was playing out of, uh, outside of um, the Church of the Holy Cross. And I thought if we look at this piece, it's a wonderful symbol for how all of these elements, the DNA elements of music come together. It starts like this. In just four bars, we have so much information. A beautiful singing melody. Right? You could sing it, you might sing it on a walk or in a shower. It's extremely melodic and tuneful. And Chopin had a, a special gift for that. Now, many other genius composers are wonderful, but they didn't have that melodic gift necessarily. Chopin has it, Mozart had it, Gershwin has it, Paul McCartney has it. So then we add in an accompaniment. And these, um, this left hand, are really just chords. This is the harmony. So the texture is melody accompaniment, and it's very elegant, it's light. But there's another element missing. And what ties it all together is this repeated note. Now I have to pause for a moment and tell you why I call it the so-called raindrop prelude. Chopin, um, you know, lived from 1810 to 1849, very briefly. He wrote 24 preludes. They're small pieces. Um, a later generation fan, composer, pianist, fan of his called Hans von Bülow, um, 
loved these preludes and named all 24 of them. Now, Chopin was not a composer who would have appreciated that. He would have hated it. But this name, Raindrop, has stuck because, and once you hear this, it's a little bit hard to unhear the story. We have this gentle rainstorm. but we're in the key of D flat major. It's a major sound. And if we just move the middle note down one note, all of a sudden we're in the minor, which is darker. So now we've talked about melody, harmony, rhythm, texture. We need to add in form. This is a three-part form, A, B, A. So we've got this rainstorm here. When we go to connect this to the B section, more menacing and you it's crashing around the texture gets thicker and you can hear kind of a thunderstorm in the end it returns to the gentle um, idea now Chopin I think not only was extremely private and didn't want his thoughts his inner thoughts and emotions revealed that's why the the title of this piece truly is prelude opus 28 number 15 in D flat major rather than the raindrop um, but he also wanted the listener, you, to be able to exercise your imagination and see how this fits into your life and your hearing. So that brings in the final element that we're going to talk about today in terms of these DNA elements, and that's time. And when I say time, I don't mean timings, as in fast, slow, what meter, or rhythmic combinations. I mean the sense of conveying movement through time, past, present, and future. And um, Chopin is a genius at being able to do that in music with no words. So for instance, you could imagine him sitting down, thinking of a memory, something beautiful that happened long ago, but then the present maybe intrudes. Or maybe he is thinking of um, something that he dreams of for the future, but again, the present or a past memory that he haunted him comes back. So this is a really important um, thing that happens in music from the early 19th century on, and we take it for granted now. And we'll talk more about that when we get to mo movie music. But for now, I'd like to play you the entire Chopin Prelude, Opus 28, number 15, in D-flat major, called The Raindrop.
And now I would like to move on to a project that came about out of that video clip that you just saw, that World Music Day really amazing encounter. And what came out of it was a CD that I um, put out called Chopin Meets the Beatles. And it was my first attempt at putting together these two different genres that I loved, but didn't understand how, why could I love them both so much? And what was it about them? So what I did was create 10 pairs of a Chopin piece uh, that he wrote, and then I made an arrangement of a Beatles tune in um, kind of a Chopin-like style. Uh, so they seemed sympathetic, but each one of the arrangements had some kind of connection to the, the real Chopin. So I'm gonna play you now the pair, which is the Chopin E minor mazurka. The mazurka is a Polish folk dance in three, four time. And um, then it's gonna be paired with yesterday. So when I started comparing these pieces, first let me play just a couple bars of the mazurka. Now there's several different kinds of mazurkas in Poland. Some of them are very lively, but these are very melancholy or have that Polish żal, um, which uh, is so much a part of Chopin's music. It starts like this. Again, there's no words here, but for a long time, all the way back to the Renaissance, composers have been making musical symbols for emotions. So in this first line, we look at the melody, a falling down line is sad, but then there's this leap up of a seventh. Now in an octave or eight notes, this is the highest we can go, but this is an almost so like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's this hope or yearning, but it steps down as though, well, that didn't happen. And it does it again lower. So the underlying structure of the melody is So that's, that's the sadness right there, the um, trauma or the loneliness. Um, then we get to the piece called Yesterday, and again, this has words, but even if you don't know the words or you don't hear them when I play the piano arrangement, we know that this melody has a similarity, at least in mood and yearning. Um, so it goes, yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. So one, two, three, four, five, six, far, there's that leap away. Now it looks as though there, and here it is again. So, I believe in yesterday, right? It's a, it's a good pandemic song, but it's got a very similar melodic structure that supports these feelings. Um, and Paul McCartney didn't steal this. This is just something that um, ties these melodists together. So here's the E minor mazurka and yesterday.
Now, many projects have come out of this sort of search for uh, music as this universal language and empathy through it. And the one that I'm working on currently, I wanna share with you really briefly. In just a moment, we're gonna look at another clip and hope that, hope that we can hear it. So one of the, um, as, we, as I have moved through this time in Poland, um, I met a wonderful jazz pianist and vocalist named Stan Breckenridge. Now, Stan is my duo partner. We've been performing together for about five years, but he is an impressive three-time Fulbrighter to Poland, and he's currently living there. But he and I are sort of committed to trying to fuse classical and jazz styles, not you know different kinds of jazz, different kinds of contemporary music, particularly American music, to make this work. And so you actually are going to get to see a sneak peek of a clip that is going to be aired tomorrow night. Um, we have a virtual concert at my old university, Adam Mickiewicz uh, University in Poznan, Poland. And so we have performed recitals there before, of course, live. This presents a big challenge with technology in this terrible time when we can't even, I can't even see you, my audience, uh, much less, you know, hear you. So um, we will be playing live solos tomorrow night, but we prepared some videos. And the thing I wanted to share with you, because we're going to be moving into American music, is a brilliant um, combination um, of Bach C minor invention. And this is a contrapuntal piece from like 1723 or so with jazz styles. We're going forward um, 300 years later. And another colleague of mine, John Salmon, a wonderful pianist and professor at um, UNC Greensboro, wrote some jazz accompaniments. So Stan will be playing those. This one he titled Consalsa. So um, the, the box starts like this. Many of you may have played that, but the accompaniment is salsa. Like that. So um, let's go ahead and look at that clip now for this sneak peek for tomorrow night. So I'm not sure how the audio came across, but you get this idea that we're both um, learning a lot with this tricky combination. Now, we couldn't play a live duet because the syncing is a problem, but these probably will be available on YouTube later if you're, if you're interested. So now with Chopin's death in 1849 and sort of representing music of the old world, Western 400 years of Western classical music, um, we're gonna go to music that's well, from the New World or America. And I want to go ahead and go to Scott Joplin, who's such a fascinating character and our really important um, African-American, first African-American composer. Um, Joplin actually wanted to be a classical composer. He was a prodigy. It's, a, it's an amazing story. His father was a born a slave, but then freed. His mother was free born. They were a fiddler and a banjo player. But Joplin's genius was recognized early on. And in this small Texas town where his parents had little money, 
He benefited from the 1830s migration of all the Germans to Texas. And there was a German music professor in every town. And so this, this one apprehended um, Joplin's uh, brilliance right away and taught him the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and Chopin, and taught him in composition. So uh, ragtime, uh, Joplin is known as the king of ragtime, but um, you know, he, he wanted so much more, but he's left us this music that is just, I would say, it isn't about past or present. It's firmly in the now. And it's the rhythm, the complicated syncopated rhythms um, that make it so amazing and joyful. And the other thing about this with that generational um, problem with uh, the kids' music, totally the older generation did not like ragtime. They thought it was sinful, it was terrible. This is a two-step. So it's a partner dance. And so the kids were dancing way too close for this ragtime. And they'd go around the floor, quick, 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 slow, quick, quick, slow to this joyous music. Um, but they too thought that it was awful. So here is the 1899 runaway hit Maple Leaf Rag. <laughs> fun to play. It's a little bit tricky to play, um, but I hope that you enjoyed it. And now moving along, I should have told you that Joplin was born in 1868. So we have Chopin dying in 49, uh, Joplin being born in 1868, and 20, 30 years later, George Gershwin is born in New York to Russian immigrant parents in 1898. And he probably is the original fuser of classical and jazz. His parents fully expected him to become a concert pianist. They gave him, worked very hard to get him lessons. He had amazing teachers in New York when he was a youngster. He was also a prodigy. He learned the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, Chopin, and even the music um, coming over from Europe at the time. So he was poised for that, but he was still a 16-year-old kid hanging around the streets of New York. And it was at this time, the ragtime, the blues and the, the jazz, which was Dixieland, coming up from the deep south to New York, just grabbed him. The story goes that when Gershwin heard this music, he said, that's American music, and that's what I want to write. And so he has these two different bodies of music. He has his hits um, from the Broadway shows that he had, the popular hits, and then he has his classical music, like the opera, Porgy and Bess, or the piano concerto, um, Rhapsody in Blue. So I'm gonna play you one of his three preludes. So Chopin had 24 preludes, Gershwin wrote three. And the middle one is based on the blues, um, sort of like must be based on the 12 bar blues going way, way back, which of course we know comes from African-American spirituals. 
but oftentimes this piece is called blue lullaby. So it begins like this, very slow, almost a dirge. And here's the melody. And so I began wondering, you know, what is it that Gershwin was hearing? What kind of blues? What did that sound like for him to translate it into this classical form? And remember that the blues, this is such a huge word. It doesn't just mean, oh, I don't feel good today. I'm having a bad day. This is deep, deep trouble, um, particularly coming out of the African-American story of trouble with the master, trouble with the boss, trouble with prison, maybe, poverty, hunger, maybe trouble with a man or a woman, but almost always in the blues, either in the uh, lyrics or in the music, there's a little twist. No matter how down and out it might sound, there's something funny or a little bit humorous to remind us that, well, we have to go on. What are we going to do? So this is um, a similar format to Chopin's Prelude, ABA, a very common form. But the middle section will pick up speed a little bit. Um, I did want to show you, though, that I imagined um, the kind of blues Gershwin might have heard could just, if I change the rhythm of his piece, which is so elegant, might sound like this. that might be in your own soundtrack, and this is Gershwin's Blue Lullaby. Thank you. 
And now we are going to wrap up. I have a, one other piece I'd like to play, but I want to say just a little bit about movie music because film music, I guess we should use the fancier title, film music combines both the old world with the new, and it's really interesting, a whole study of the composers in Europe who in the um, early 20th century were fleeing fascism, settled in Los Angeles, and made their living with film scores. So there's a lot going into that. Um, they borrowed a lot of the techniques from classical composers, um, especially Wagner's technique called leitmotif or leading motive. So it um, could be just a chord or a melody that conveys a person, a place, a thing, a concept like love. So if I play this movie piece for you, must know that's Darth Vader. And if you don't know Star Wars, which is kind of hard to imagine in America, you can hear that that is just darkness and evil. Or if we have a... Another theme. Anytime you hear that theme, you know what is happening. Um, one other from Harry Potter, and I'm going to stand up, and you know the piano can be plucked from the inside. It's like a harp. I can, I can pluck those strings. So what about this, this tune from Harry Potter? you could hear that. I have the pedal down and I was strumming the strings. And it's, even if you don't know those movies, that's magic right there, a symbolism. So the last piece that I'd like to play for you is definitely a bridge between the classical world and the popular movie world, popular culture. And it is the very famous song called Over the Rainbow. We know it as Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And this is again, um, the wonderful composers were brilliantly educated in all this classical music, but they turned it towards, I would say, music for the people. And it's from the great 1939 blockbuster movie, The Wizard of Oz. And if you know that movie at all, you know that it is all about finding home. Dorothy, the young girl, I think she's about 14, she lives with her old Auntie M and Uncle Henry on this farm, and they tell her to go find a place where she's not gonna get in trouble, and she feels that no one understands her, very early in the film, she sings this wonderful song um, over the rainbow. But then she goes off and decides she's going to leave home. It doesn't hold anything for her. And you know the story. Um, she gets caught in a tornado, winds up in Oz, this magical world, and spends the entire time trying to get back home. She clicks her heels three times and says, there's no place like home. This is such an interesting piece because it grounds so many people all over the world. Certainly my friends in Poland know this movie, know this song, and I think that's true all over. It's personal memories for people, but movie watching is a group, um, a group effort. So, or not effort, but it's a, a group gathering. Let me just refresh your memory about the melody. <laughs> Again, we're not going to do the lyrics. You don't need the lyrics, but they're wonderful. Somewhere. What is that? It's a leap of an entire octave. So it's this hopeful yearning. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. So what is so interesting, again, we've had melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, time, Somewhere over the rainbow, blue skies are blue. So it's somewhere in the future, this girl is dreaming. There's a land that I heard of 
once in a lullaby. So that's the past right there. And here's Dorothy singing it to us right now. This is her real time experience. So that's one of the reasons it's such a wonderful soundtrack piece. And I hope you enjoy now. Um, it's kind of a Chopin arrangement of Over the Rainbow. <laughs> So um, I hope that you have enjoyed these selections today. I want to say we can, I'm certainly happy to take questions um, or play a few more pieces, but I want to say going forward, as you sort of, if you process this information today, I would say start with your own musical soundtrack, look at that and what is in it and why do you think it's there and how does it help you in your life? Um, and it, how, how does it help you meet others? But then I would say, go a step further, what about all these different kinds of music that you don't listen to? Now, I'm not saying you have to like them, but maybe listening more or finding someone who likes them um, might inform you a bit and you might have more in common. The hardest third step would be to find someone whose music you know you detest. Uh, for me, the heavy lift would be something like heavy metal. Um, but if you know that that music motivates somebody passionately, you would find out a lot about them and their culture, their world, perhaps, um, by investigating that. So those are just some thoughts. I think that we go through so many phases from early childhood. Um, you know, what we like um, at five or 10, we might think when we get to be a teenager, oh, that's really dumb. But you'd be surprised what emerges um, as life progresses, and especially as we go into aging um, and lose parents and lose dear friends, the songs that will come back to us. So I would say, for instance, I grew up singing in the church, and some of those hymns that I learned, which are not you know, really a part of my life now, oh my goodness, are they with me? Christmas carols, they are deep down in there somewhere. So I don't know that it's predictive, but I think that uh, I'm fascinated by the concept that the music in our soundtrack really chooses us. We don't say, hmm, what would I really like to love today? Just like we don't choose easily who do we love or who we're attracted to. They kind of, it kind of comes to us. So with this um, question, it's, it's like an open-ended story. I don't know, but I would guess so. I think it's, it's down in there and it'll emerge probably later on in some way.
Well, I think that Paul McCartney's answer is a great one. And I think that we know, for instance, historically, that Chopin spent his youth listening not only to the serious, the serious or studied classical music of the day, classical with a, a little c, not classical with a, a capital C as in 18th century classicism, Haydn, Mozart, Mozart Beethoven, but the, um, he had the classical music, but he also spent summers in the country listening to um, not only uh, folk music, Polish folk music, but Jewish singing. Um, so kind of like um, uh, what became Klezmer. So he acknowledges most composers will be able to tell you, oh, I love this, I love that. Um, so I think that I don't know about Paul McCartney. I think he is a genius, but it's kind of funny that he says that. <laughs> but I think that it's obvious when you look at the huge range of his songs that music from after World War I, which would have been his dad's era, um, really plays into it. And he really is a crooner. Um, he's probably more of a crooner than a rock and roller, um, but he loved that too. So I agree with that. Ah, well, um, to make my arrangements, I needed to, of course, pay royalties to get those songs. And I'm working on some of my own original music um, because since my Fulbright, I have just sort of found this new ability to compose music. But um, it's, it's an advantage, if you can, because it is costly. It's definitely costly to um, buy the rights to, uh, for use for CDs, for live performance, etc. But it's worth it um, because these musicians as artists the world round have never been paid enough what they should be, so. An example oh, sorry, of, um, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Um, um. <laughs> because it uses this pentatonic scale. Um, this five note scale, just probably more, more theory than you'd like to know, but what's amazing is um, it's the same notes that are used in Amazing Grace. Um, It's, they're used in a different way, and that's what I'm talking about with this DNA of music. You can have the same um, bones, but it's used in a completely different way. But yes, there's wonderful. Once you start looking for these connections, my, my ears have been really kind of overloaded for the last couple of years because I have so many things I want to combine, um, and I haven't, just haven't been able to get them all out yet. So hunt for these things. It's just fabulous. And the other thing is, you know, if something's in your soundtrack, because likely you are, you hear it and you haven't heard it in forever and you start crying. That's what happens to me. I burst into tears and think, oh, kind of like my long lost friend, this music that was talking to me about this important thing. Um, and um, that's, that's a sure a sure sign. Or you, you're thrilled and you start dancing around because you haven't heard that song or that symphony or whatever in a million years. So. Pamela, thanks so much for an amazing presentation. And we also would like to thank our Fulbright Association members and donors who make all of our programming possible. To find more about the Fulbright forums, you can visit fulbright.org forums. And I think there's one more request for a song, Pamela, at the very end of this presentation. Thanks. Yes, I'll play you out to summertime. And I just want to, again, thank my local sponsor, Take the Lead North Carolina, and our wonderful Fulbright Association up in Washington. And for you folks out there, these are two wonderful nonprofits, and they can always use a little assistance if, if you're so inclined. So here is 
summertime and have a wonderful, safe holiday. Go out there and listen to all this just beautiful music in the world. And um, thank you so much for letting me share this with you.